Welcome back to La Master Tech YouTube, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about the top five tools I use as a controls and automation engineer. So this video is going to be a continuation on the controls and automation series that I started up in the recent months on the channel. A lot of people have had a lot of questions about how they can learn more about this field, and because it's a slightly more niche field of engineering, there isn't a ton of great information about it out there in my opinion. So I wanna help bridge the gap. We recently did a video on both what controls and automation engineers do, what is controls and automation engineering, and the hardware that you will see as a controls and automation engineer. So that was things like PLCs and relays and HMIs, but today's video is going to focus on the tools that you would use as a controls and automation engineer. Now, without any further ado, let's dive in. So the first tool I'm going to talk about is the digital multimeter. And in terms of basic electrical troubleshooting, it really doesn't get any better than one of these. They start as low as like $20. You can get one from Walmart or Amazon that does the basic functionality pretty well for you. Before you start working on high voltage or dangerous electrical systems you should be far more qualified than just saying hey I've got a multimeter but these can do things like detect whether or not there's voltage at a source tell how much voltage there is relative to ground check for AC and DC voltage you can even lift a wire and you can calculate amperage through current you can detect point to point if you have continuity which helps you when you're trying to trace wires in a jumbled old electrical panel and you can also do resistance checks which help you detect for like partially blown fuses and things like that but digital multimeter is a great tool to have around not just if you're a controls and automation engineer if you do any sort of hobby work or tinkering or electrical work around your house which you should also be very careful with then a digital multimeter is a great call this one came in a soldering kit that i bought from amazon and i think the whole kit was like 40 bucks and it works great it's very reliable kind of the more robust industrial version you'll probably see a lot come from the company fluke and the only reason I have one for personal use is because I renovated a house and I was doing a lot of home electrical. So I decided to go out and get a more industrially hardened one. It's not necessarily normal that you would have a fluke for home use. Your company might just have two or three to loan out because they're more on the expensive side. But every engineer who is doing significant work in a control panel should have a fluke or digital multimeter because it tells you so much about the status of your electrical signals. This isn't moving on to item two yet. This is item 1.5, but in the same kind of vein of testing and validating electrical signals in a panel, I think a voltage pen is something for anyone who is doing anything near any electrical circuits. It's something valuable for them to go out and get. They make these in uh, AC and DC in one pen, so you can check if a circuit is live, whether you're working on DC or AC circuits. They make some more advanced ones that can tell you uh, additional feedback, but the main purpose of a voltage pen is that when it's on, it will start blinking rapidly like an LED will flash red if there's voltage present and it'll start beeping at you if there's voltage present. So you can hold this up to a wire that you're about to take off of a terminal that you don't think should have electricity flowing through it. And if it starts beeping with a voltage pen, that's a really good first check that you were about to do something pretty unsafe. So with voltage pens and multimeters, we've covered electrical troubleshooting and the most common tool used for that. So the second tool I'm going to talk about, and this one should be kind of obvious if you're familiar with what controls and automation engineering is, but it is the wire strippers. So a pair of wire strippers are typically capable of cutting a piece of wire and removing the shielding from it so you get the bare copper on it. And it might seem really obvious that if you're doing any work in a control panel, you need a pair of these on hand, but I can't tell you the number of times I've gone to a project, I've had a young engineer with me, and they haven't had a pair of wire strippers, they didn't realize that they needed them. But it's just useful to know you will need your wire strippers pretty much constantly. There are super high tech versions of these. There are also cable strippers, which when you have a cable that has four or five core of wire inside of it, it can grab the sleeve and pull it off of all of your five wires that are inside. So this can get way more complicated. And I'm kind of lumping like uh, sets for crimping ferrules, which are nice uh, like metal tube 
ends that cl clamp onto the copper on the end of your wire. I'm kind of roping all of the wire prep tools into, you can get by with a pair of wire strippers and sometimes you might want like a box cutter type knife. Um, if you do have a cable or if you're doing Profinet cable, which is really shielded and has a thicker uh, edge to it, and you don't have the specific tools meant for crimping that style of cable, you can usually get by with cutting a slit in the edge of the shielding, peeling it back, taking the individual wires out, and then you can just strip them if need be with your wire strippers. So in my opinion, wire strippers and a box cutter can get almost any electrical work done that you have to get done, but just know the world of wire prep is actually way deeper than that, and we could go on for a very long time about the right type of ferrules, how when to use splicing and heat shrink, the different types of wire nuts or terminal mounts and things like that, but we're gonna keep it simple. You absolutely will want a good pair of wire strippers. Now, item number three is something that might catch you a little uh, by surprise if you haven't done significant work in automation and controls engineering, but I would recommend any engineer who's spending significant time in the field or bench testing stuff in the office, get themselves a 120 to 24 volt uh, power supply. If you're in the UK or internationally, you might wanna get yourself a 230, uh, to 24 volt DC power supply. Um, but the important point here is you're taking single phase voltage, you're taking the most common type of wall outlet voltage, and you're turning it into the most standard DC type of control voltage, which is 24 volt DC. You are going to be stunned by the number of times having one of these on hand or in your bag is super useful. Some of the most common reasons you might need one of these power supplies is there could be a lot of scenarios where a control panel was designed with high voltage, three phase, 480 or higher electricity in the same cabinet as switches and PLCs and HMIs. And strictly speaking, if you're going to be working on anything with that 480 voltage live, you should be in full arc flash gear every time, even if you're not touching the 480 side of your cabinet. But it's not always conducive, it's not always realistic to say that you're going to be arc flashed up, so sometimes it's better to just kill the power to the cabinet. But then you run into the problem where if you kill the power to the cabinet and you're using that in-feed power to power the lower voltage things as well with a 480 to 24 volt or 120 transformer, now you need some way of powering on the PLC, powering on the switch, powering on the HMI so that you can do troubleshooting in service with a power supply that is fed from somewhere else. So one of the more common, more scrappy things that you might do as an automation engineer is get a really long extension cord, find a nearby outlet, power up a power supply, and then you can have all of those lower voltage things like the PLC and the switch online. You can do your software-based troubleshooting. You can even do wire validation with the high voltage components powered down. Some other formats that you might see power supplies in, and again, like your company might already have one on hand, your customer might already have one on hand. These are kind of common, although not super frequently used in the US as far as I know. Um, they're just like a metal box that has the circuitry for transforming the voltage on the inside and then uh, little terminals with a plastic shield. They do exactly the same, it's just a different way of looking at it, but it's nice to know what you're looking at. And it's also worth noting some of these can take uh, multiple input voltages. So this one, for example, can work with 120 or 230, but you have to adjust a dip switch to tell it which one it's getting. And they also make these that output 5 volts DC, 12 volts DC, 24 volts DC. So make sure when you're specifying it, you get the right one. If the majority of the work that you're doing is bench testing or in like a garage environment like here, where I wanna make sure something works the way I'm expecting it to work before I power it up permanently and buy a power supply just for that circuit, uh, an adjustable DC power supply is a really tremendous tool. I don't think you would throw this in your book bag and keep it on hand as an automation engineer doing a lot of work in the field. You absolutely could. There's no reason not to. This would be able to do exactly the same thing that would be able to do as long as you get one that's able to output 100, uh, 24 volt DC. Most common thing you would want is 120 volts in or single phase household voltage in and then 
24 volt DC out. That will let you do a ton of great troubleshooting and give you a lot of flexibility and the ability to make working on systems way safer. Now, item four, I thought about roping in with item two, which was all of the wire prep stuff, but I decided it's important enough and different enough that I'm gonna make it its own topic, and that is the terminal screwdrivers. So when you are wiring up stuff in a control panel, the most common thing you'll see is a screw clamp terminal base. Some uh, plants, some people trust the spring clamp terminal bases as well, which is basically you push down a lever, you put the wire in and you release the lever and now you have a spring clamp on it. Um, but the more common one to see, honestly, especially in older plants, is screw clamp terminal bases where you have to tighten down a screw to clamp onto the copper. This is sort of the most common way to land anything electrically. And what's surprising and annoying is just how tiny the terminals can be on those. You might think that you have a very fine screwdriver, but if all you've ever done is around the house home projects and home electricity, I promise the smallest screwdriver you have will be way too big for the terminals used in an industrial setting. So what's nice is when you can find a thin screwdriver that's rated, this one for example is up to a thousand volts um, and they're incredibly thin. They have very thin, typically flat heads. So a terminal screwdriver, it's not expensive. It's incredibly important. And you would not believe this is an example of terminal blocks. These aren't even close to as small as they come. And this terminal screwdriver is already almost too large to fit in these terminals. So having a set of very fine electronic screwdrivers is super important, which just gives me an awesome opportunity to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Xcool. Xcool is the manufacturer of one of the most versatile and incredibly high quality electronic screwdriver and drill sets that I've ever seen. More than 30 screwdriver heads, it is impossible to come across a term terminal or specialty screw or nut that has a fitting that this will not fit. On top of that, it has nine precision drill bits and it has a flashlight on the end so that when you are in control panels working in very dim light because industrial settings are always pathetically poorly lit, you have the ability to screw and unscrew components with essentially zero clearance because it's electronic. And then on top of that, you can turn on a light so that you're able to see what you're doing. This is one of the coolest products I've ever gotten to partner with. And thank you very much to Xcool for sponsoring this video. Be sure to check out their screwdriver and other products linked in the description of the video below. And now it's time to talk about number five, the final most common tool that you will need as a controls and automation engineer. And I saved it for last because it's a little bit of a tough one to show, a little bit of a tough one to talk about, and explain, but I'm going to do my best. And I figured if you made it to this point in the video, you probably don't hate me enough to click away as I try to explain this rather complicated concept, but tool number five that you will absolutely need as an automation and controls engineer is an engineering laptop. And the reason I specify engineering laptop is because your work will probably give you a laptop that has a whole bunch of IT settings on it. They might not let you change your IP address. They might not let you download software from the internet. They might not let you have admin access to your laptop. That is going to be a huge deal breaker for an automation and controls engineer. So it's very important that you have a lot of RAM. 16 gigabytes is probably the bare minimum. 32 or definitely 64 would absolutely be preferable because one of the most common things that you would do as an automation and controls engineer is you might have virtual machines, which are basically virtualized sessions of a computer that has certain engineering software loaded onto it that you open using the brains of your computer. So if you're running a laptop that has 16 gigs of RAM and you want to open a virtual machine that needs eight gigs of RAM for it to be able to run, you've just reduced the actual memory your laptop is capable of using to do other things to eight gigs right away because now half of it's been dedicated to opening a virtual machine. If the virtual machine concept can confuses you a little bit, don't worry about that too much for now, but just know that there are engineering softwares like Tia Portal for Siemens or Studio 5000 for Rockwell, where depending on the task that you're doing, if you're online with equipment, if you're trying to make live edits to programming, you could easily be using eight gigs of RAM 
just running certain projects. Uh, Twincat for Beckoff will just gobble up your system resources. So if you only have a laptop that has 16 gigs of RAM or is super locked down by company permissions, you're going to have a very hard and annoying time as a controls and automation engineer. If you're at a company that only has a few automation and controls engineers, it might be hard to properly articulate to them how badly you need a really open laptop but it's super important that you be able to put any required software to support bringing up your system on that laptop. Of course, you should still follow info security uh, protocols. You should still have IT vet software and make sure it's not coming from malicious parties. But if you're not able to change your IP address, download boot P, which is capable of just setting IP addresses in theory, it never works, but then if you're not able to go and grab the software you need to program a drive or a, a VFD or any smart component in your system where there's a little package or plug-in on the vendor's uh, website and you're not able to quickly get it, it is going to slow you down, you'll have to open a ticket, you'll have to cuss out the IT department every time, and nobody wants that. So just make sure that if you're an automation and controls engineer and you're spending a lot of time in this field, you go through whatever steps are required to get yourself an engineering laptop, admin access where you can quickly change your IP address and network settings, be able to download software that you deem is necessary to do your job, and make sure that it has a lot of system RAM. So make sure it has a lot of memory. And in addition to a lot of RAM, preferably at least 500 gigabytes or maybe a terabyte of actual disk memory, because some of those software that you need to program PLCs take up a ton of install space as well. So I know it might seem silly in 2024 to say that a laptop is one of the most important tools that you'll need as an automation engineer, like of course you have a laptop, but this very specific type of like an automation and controls engineering laptop to go out and get a beefy laptop and make your company pay for it. That is gonna do it for the list. That is gonna do it for today's video. I hope you found it useful. As always, be sure to let me know what questions you have in the comments below, and let me know what tools you feel like you missed. If you're in this field, I'm super interested to hear back from you. What sort of tools do you use every day at your job that I didn't touch on in this video? So be sure to let me know about that as well. Before we go, I just wanna say we hit 15,000 subscribers on the channel today. That is absolutely insane to me. I started this channel because I was feeling like I was in a rut. I wanted to learn new software. I wanted to share some of the things I was learning with people on the internet. I really don't think I ever imagined 15,000 subscribers and I definitely couldn't have pictured some of the things that have happened along that journey. So thank you so much specifically to my Patreon supporters. You guys were huge getting us to this point. Thank you to everyone who leaves super supportive comments and has been supporting the channel for a very long time. And thank you to everyone who watches any Lamaster Tech video, leaves a like on the video and subscribes to the channel. I appreciate you all so much. I can't believe we're here and I'm super excited to see where we're going. So as always, good luck with your work, good luck with your projects, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.